All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and, and we have spent a couple of weeks uh, in this specific passage, and uh, for good reason, uh, we're going we're gonna to continue looking at some things that we began looking at last Sunday morning. The passage that we are currently studying here is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through verse 8, okay? So I'll go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 6 through 8, and I'm going to pick up where we left off last Sunday morning, okay? And, and once again, I know that uh, the information that we're looking at is uh, going to be review for the majority of you, but we do have a number of newer folks that uh, are new to the issues of dispensationalism and what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, for those of you who are well-grounded on some of this fundamental truth, you, you'll, you'll just patiently wade through it, okay? Uh, but again, we're, we're going to be sensitive to those folks that are, are new to the doctrine, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, 6. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Two weeks ago, we demonstrated that when verse 8 makes a reference to these princes, it's not limited to governmental figures in history. Paul isn't limiting uh, that label princess to the Roman government 2,000 years ago. In the Bible, we see that God will use the human agent. He will use uh, human government officials and authorities to communicate to the power behind that authority. So we saw some passages that demonstrated that God can, can and does communicate to his adversary, he communicates to Satan through the instrumentality of human figures, whether it's uh, the king of Babylon, for example, whether it's the king of Tyrus. Uh, we, we, we understand that God is directing information to the so-called deep state, that invisible realm. Okay, So with that in mind, what the Apostle Paul here is, is dealing with is something that is absolutely profound. When Paul here talks about the mystery, now, now remember we understand the context, this is a rebuke. The Corinthians are being rebuked. And the problem at Corinth is they are gravitating towards human wisdom, they're valuing and esteeming human wisdom above that which is written, and certainly above that, which the Apostle Paul desires to communicate to them. So Paul now, in verse uh, 6, he talks about a, a system of wisdom. Notice verse 6, Howbeit we speak, notice, wisdom among them that are perfect. Remember, not people who are sinless, perfect in the sense of they're participating in the edification design, to be perfect perfected has nothing to do, I shouldn't say nothing, it's not focusing in on a believer's ability never to sin, but rather to be perfected is a reference to the growth and maturation process that a believer is privileged to participate in. So uh, Paul here, by way of rebuke, is informing the Corinthians that there is a system of revelation, a system of wisdom that uh, uh, is available to those that are participating in the edification design. They're being properly educated in the doctrines of grace. The Corinthians, on the other hand, are not. They're still carnal. They're still operating as babes. That's why he actually calls them babes in chapter 3. So when Paul talks about this system of revelation, this system of wisdom, he says in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God. Now notice, in a what? Mystery. Paul elaborates, he calls it even the hidden wisdom. When Paul uses the language mystery, he's not talking about information that is mysterious. It's a mystery not because of man's inability to understand or comprehend. You know, calculus to a three-year-old boy is a mystery. You understand that. 
Paul is not suggesting that this system of revelation is just too difficult to grasp. Man doesn't have the capacity to fully understand the rich truths. Uh, when Paul uses the word mystery, he is talking about a system of revelation that was never known before because God never revealed it before. That's why it is a mystery. We'll, 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 I don't, we already did this last Sunday morning. I'm trying to avoid going back and reviewing what we dealt with last Sunday morning. But just be mindful. We find terms like mystery. We find terms like secret. We, he, we have here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul calls it the hidden wisdom of God in the mind and heart of God. He suppressed this system of revelation... God deliberately did not make it known to ages past. He did not make it known to generations. He never made it known to the sons of men. God kept this information hid in himself. So man could never understand it because God never said anything about it. And that's the crux of the issue when we, as, quote, mid-Acts dispensationalists, make a big deal about right division and dispensational Bible study. We see the distinction between a system of information that was revealed through human history, it was spoken about by the mouth of all of his holy prophets, and a system of information that no one knew anything about because God never told anyone. God kept it to himself. That's why we have the language, it's a mystery, it's a secret, and it's hidden. And I want to emphasize, when God says he hid it, he mums the word. He hid it from humanity. He hid it from the angelic creation. He hid it from ages. He hid it from generations. He hid it in himself. Only God knew anything about it. Now, why am I emphasizing that? Because what Paul is saying in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, world as in the world system, world as in the operation of the cosmos, which is satanically uh, uh, influenced, satanically affected. Remember the course of this what? World. The spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Listen, there is this prince in the power of the air. There is this uh, uh, power that manipulates the course of this world. And, and we'll look at a couple of uh, more passages that want, will once again affirm that the authorities that Paul is talking about are invisible and spiritual in nature. But this is why this passage is absolutely profound. Verse 8 which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not, what? Have crucified the Lord of glory. That's why God kept it secret in himself. God, by keeping this information suppressed and hidden in his own thinking, never revealed to the creation, never revealed. And, and we're going to see the, the, the time markers uh, that the Apostle Paul is going to lay out for it. He kept it secret because of verse 8. Because had they known it, they would not have crucified. And next Sunday morning, look at the end of verse 8. The Lord of glory. God is manifesting the magnitude of his glorious eternal purpose because he kept it a secret. So, I want to do this for, a, for a, a, a few moments here, okay? When we understand verse 8, we're going to compress history. We're going to compress Bible history for just a few minutes. We're not throwing the Bible out, all right? You understand that. I just want you to appreciate how the Apostle Paul here is, is, is providing a, a heavenly perspective of, of history, okay? Notice once again at verse 8. Uh, seven, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which, now notice, 
God ordained, listen, God determined and designed and planned out a, a strategy, a tactical response to the adversary and the adversary's bloodlust desire to be like the Most High God. You've got to understand something. There is an invisible conflict raging. And so we, we saw, for example, in Isaiah chapter 14, we saw, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 28, that this adversary, he literally strategized a battle plan. He was going to ascend into the heavens. He was going to sit upon the mount of the north. He was going to be like the Most High God. God's response to that strategy of usurpation, that strategy which sought to, to, to take the reins of rightful authority from Almighty God, God responded by devising a plan that God said, I'm keeping it secret. And so when Paul here in verse 7 describes this mystery, which God ordained before the what? The world. Now again, on to our glory, we'll say a few things about that. So when Paul talks about this hidden information, remember, has nothing to do with man's intellect, man's ability to know or not know. You can't know anything God doesn't tell you about, right? I mentioned last Sunday morning, we, we, we know what faith is, right? The formula for faith demands God say something to you. We're not going to go back to Romans chapter 4. You know why Abraham was strong in faith? Because he believed what God said to him. So there's no such thing as faith unless God says something. So, just as it is absolutely, absolutely important to believe what God says, it's absolutely important not to believe what God has not said. So when we talk about this information which was kept secret, it's critically important. Uh, it, it, man's intelligence is irrelevant. It is impossible for anybody to know this information because God never told anybody. So when Paul deals with this system of information, critically important, when did God ordain this? To ordain something literally means God already established his battle plan. He established his tactical response to the adversary's attempt to be like the Most High God. You know when God devised it and designed it and planned it all out? Before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the verse says, before what? The world began. So we're going to take God's word for just a few minutes and let's just compress God's word. We're going to take before Genesis 1, and Paul's going to, we're going to go to the verses. He keeps talking about what was God doing before then. And now Paul describes all of this hidden information, but Paul is the one who uses clear, precise language to, to demonstrate that that hidden system is now revealed. But when we understand history in, from a Pauline perspective, we compress Genesis chapter 1 before the world began, and we squeeze Acts chapter 9 together. Everything that God ordained before creation, He kept it secret and chose to reveal it for the first time through the instrumentality of this individual whom we now know as Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. And it can't begin any earlier than Acts chapter 9. Remember, the event of the cross, the event of the death of Messiah was prophesied. But the eternal consequence of the crucifixion, the, the uh, result of the death of Jesus Christ was unprophesied. So when we learn about the cross, we go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we value and appreciate and study the literal event of the cross. You can't go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or early Acts to find out the meaning of the cross. 
And I know that's startling to the ranks of evangelical fundamentalism and even ecumenicism. What do you mean? You mean you can't study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and learn about the rich, deep consequences of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? You can't. And we've been through those verses. You remember Peter tried to prevent Jesus from dying. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter, he, when Peter preaches the cross, he never says, praise God, hallelujah, Jesus died on that cross as a propitiation for the sins of the world. Eternal life is a free gift by grace through faith. Did Peter ever say that in Acts? Not once was Peter a failure as an apostle. You know, you've got, even, you've got fundamental brethren out there that slanders Peter. They accuse Peter of being a failure. Peter of being unfaithful. Peter of uh, being a derelict as an apostle. Peter was such a miserable failure that God now had to raise up Paul. That's not Bible study, folks. That's twisting God's word to teach something God's word does not teach. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, was he not? Didn't Peter have the keys to the kingdom? Didn't Peter function by him in his apostolic authority? So in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches the cross, you know nothing about the consequences of the shed blood of Jesus Christ as the full, satisfying, permanent payment for all the sins of the world. Peter never says that. You know what Peter does in Acts chapter 2? He says, Israel, shame on you. You killed the king. Shame on you, Israel, you killed the king. Isn't that interesting? There isn't any good news in Acts chapter 2 about the cross. But you ask your typical, even, you know, you're, you, and they assume, don't, they just assume. Well, of course Peter's talking about the, 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 death, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the full total payment for the sins of the whole world. But it's not there. You can't believe something God doesn't tell you. It's dangerous to read back into passages, truth that God didn't reveal back then. Now, again, we learn about the historic event, but we don't learn about the eternal ramifications until the Apostle Paul. This is why it's important. There is a tactical, strategic reason why God kept it secret, because if the princes of this world knew, and I'm talking about the heavenly authorities up there, if they would have known about this system, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul, God is manifesting the magnitude of his genius and wisdom by keeping this information to himself. Go to Ephesians. When, when we're going to compress God's word here for just a second, go to Ephesians chapter 3, okay? Ephesians chapter 3, and, and I just want to share some passages. Ephesians chapter 3, notice in verse 10, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Now remember, Paul cannot deal with all of this when he writes to the Corinthians. All Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, 7, and 8 is, listen, if the princes of this world would have known about it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. It isn't until we get into the advanced levels of edification, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, for example, that we learn about the rich details. For example, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship, the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in who? Not hid from men because they're ignorant. This information was not knowable because God never said anything about it. Now notice who created all things by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. To the intent. Let that sink in for a second. To the intent. Why does God desire in verse 9 to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid? What is God's intention? Verse 10 to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where in heavenly places might be known by the church 
Let's appreciate God. Now, we're going to talk about the Lord of glory next week, and that's some language that takes us back to the book uh, of Exodus. God says, I'm a man of war. And this is what God is doing. God has unveiled, he's unveiled his wisdom, this hidden information. He's unveiled it to the intent what God is doing is he's taken that veil of covering off this system of revelation for the distinct intention of communicating to his adversary the principalities and powers where in heavenly places the manifold wisdom of who? God Almighty looks at Satan straight in the eyeballs and he says, you know what I just... Satan, and when we get to, you know, God, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Satan thought he was carrying out the, the, the master stroke of rebellion. I'm going to kill this king. I'm going to kill this king. And he succeeded, did he not? Je uh, Satan succeeded in having Jesus Christ kill through the instrumentality of God's own people. So Satan thought, I won. I secured victory. Satan was convinced in his corrupted wisdom that now I have achieved my goal to be like the Most High God. And God turns around and he says, guess what, pal? I'm going to reveal something about what you just did. You know what you just did? You just doomed your plan to utter destruction. What God is doing by revealing this information is communicating to that adversary that God had a response to Isaiah chapter 14 and he kept it secret. God's tactical response to the adversary is to use that crucifixion and the rejection of his son for the purpose of taking from the adversary what the adversary thought belong to him. Read verse 10 again, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. You know, God is such a master. God, just think about it. Here's this anointed cherub. Here's this creature who was created in beauty. He was the summation of all wisdom. And God, with a smile, let him get away with what he was doing. God said, okay. And didn't say anything for centuries, for millennia. Didn't say anything. And now God says, now I'm going to tell you what my answer to yours, your plan of rebellion is. My son died, not just to give you eternal life. Isn't that a good thing? But God is saying he died to reclaim something that Jesus Christ originally created for the glory of his heavenly Father. We'll get into all of that. The Lord of glory. Listen, Jesus Christ created the heaven and the earth. Why? To the glory of his Father. And the, the adversary, he, he stole those heavenly places. And the only way Jesus could get those places back is by dying on that cross. Now, we know that that is the answer to our sin problem. But do you understand it's the answer to the rebellion that rages? You understand it? the cross? It is so near and dear to the heart of God because not only did his son, his son die for the wretch that we are, the wretches that we are, his son also died to get back those realms that Jesus specifically created for the glory of his father. You understand why his father is so tremendously pleased in his beloved son? Now remember, was that stuff knowable in the past? No. We now know it. Jesus died to get those realms back. Now let that sink in for a second here. Go to, go to Philipp, uh, uh, Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Listen, the, the, the eternal ramifications of the cross, it's not simply limited to my payment, the payment for my sins. He died to reclaim the heavens. I mean, that's just, that, that's a seismic consequence of Calvary. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Notice in Colossians chapter 2, 
verse uh, 14. Colossians 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. By the way, who before Paul ever said anything about the law being crucified with Jesus? Nobody. Peter didn't know anything about it. The Lord Jesus never said anything about it. Yeah, when I go to that cross, I'm taking the law with me. You understand? Again, God kept it secret. First revealed to. That's why I want to compress God's word. Let's go. When Paul talks about the mystery, all he says is this was already ordained before Genesis 1, but now it's revealed, and it isn't revealed any earlier than Acts chapter 9. It concerns the cross. It concerns the eternal result. Paul's not dealing so much with the, the event which was prophesied, he's talking about the unprophesied consequence. So in light of that, now, ver, the end of verse 14, nailing it to his cross, look at verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers. Now remember what we read in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10? The principalities and powers, where are they located? heavenly places. Remember, here's God responding thousands of years later. Oh, God's a patient God, isn't he? You know, you and I, imagine if you were sitting on this information. If I had information that I know will uh, result in the utter demise and destruction of my enemy, I can't wait to tell him. And you know what God does? God is so chilled out. He says, you give me the best you have. By the way, I love it when Paul's going to use that language. He said, the, the foolishness of God is what? Man, so God says, I'm going to let it play itself out. And I don't say anything to anybody. And then when this occurred, all of a sudden, we learn through the Apostle Paul, verse 15, and having spoiled, and you understand what it means to spoil, right? We're not talking about, you know, Laura Gombert putting her food in the fridge. We're not talking about food being spoiled. You know what it means to spoil, right? Remember what the Lord Jesus said real quickly. Go to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter uh, uh, 12. Remember when the Lord Jesus, he, he, he uses that word spoil. And we understand the context in which that word is spoil. You know, uh, uh, when you spoil an enemy, when you spoil an army. And by the way, in the Bible, you, you learn all about spoiling a vanquished enemy. Let's just use recent, more recent history, the, the, the end of World War II, correct? What, 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 they gutted the industrial, I mean, I, I understand it was the industrial complex of Germany was bombed. We understand that. But you understand, anything that was left, it, to the victor go the what? Spoiled. The Soviet Union, for, well, Russia at the time, they literally took whatever factories survived the, the, the bombing, the Allied bombing, every single screw and bolt was, was logged, and that entire factory was dismantled in Germany and was moved piece by piece to the Soviet Union. What, what right did the Russians have to take all of the factories in Germany? To the victor go the what? So we understand the word spoil. So when you think about the heaven, in what sense did God spoil the princi principalities and powers in the heavenly places? In what sense? What did God take rightfully from his adversary? Remember in Matthew chapter 12, really quick, Matthew chapter 12, you know, Jesus Christ is being accused of being a, a, a hack of the devil. Remember all of that stuff? And, and so anyway, right in the, in the context, verse 28, Matthew 12, verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and here we go spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will what spoil it you see uh, you have to overcome the enemy you have to overcome the adversary and once you overcome the burglar you overcome the threat you overcome the enemy then you can spoil okay so you understand the the concept of spoiling 
going back now to Colossians chapter 2. Go, go, go back to Colossians chapter 2. So the idea of spoiling heavenly, uh, the, the principalities and powers in heavenly places, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them. Those satanic powers, the, the, the satanic operatives that are functioning there in the, the heavenly places. God through the cross, by, by now revealing this, this system of information, He is literally intending the accomplishments of Calvary to be communicated to His Majesty Satan for the distinct reason of demonstrating, I beat you. I beat you at your own game. I took your wise, crafty plan and I used it against you. You're not that smart, are you, pal? And, 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 and did God have to send 20,000 angels? He allowed Satan to give God his best shot. And God said, I beat you. I beat you. Uh, verse 15, and have, have, uh, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What, what does the it refer to? The cross. You see why God Almighty values, loves, and adores the crucifixion? Oh yeah, don't get me wrong. He loves his son for his willingness to die for you. But he loves his son because Jesus Christ triumphed, triumphed over that adversary in the cross. The crucifixion has eternal ramifications as it affects the heavenly places. Jesus spoiled the enemy and gave back to his father what rightly belongs to him. The mystery is a big deal to God. Now, I know we have opponents that mock us, they scorn us, they ridicule us. I've heard, I, hey, listen, I've been mocked and ridiculed by family members. Believe me, you can't hurt me, I, I don't care. The point is this, you know, we, we, we can be accused of all sorts of things. Paul, 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 you don't believe the words of Jesus. You know, you, you hear it all over, the, and, and listen, the mystery may not be important to our, advers, our, our opponents, but the mystery is important to God the Father. Now, is it any wonder why the satanic policy of evil is so hell-bent in suppressing the revelation of that system? Because look at verse 15. The end of verse 15. He made a show of them openly. God makes an open embarrassment of that creature who thought, I'm as smart. By the way, Satan literally thought he was created to be God's equal. You need to understand something about pride. Satan convinced himself, God needs me. God created me to be perfect in wisdom, uh, the summation of wisdom, perfect in beauty. God created me to be his equal. And you know what pride actually convinced the adversary? And I can do a better. Listen, Satan literally thought he could orchestrate the governmental affairs of the universe better than the one who created it. Who created it, by the way, according to Colossians, Jesus. And go Real quick, go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm jumping the gun just a little bit. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Who created all things? Well... Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? Who's the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by him, Jesus Christ, we're all... So here you have this anointed cherub. And by the way, what does Messiah mean? Anointed. Jesus is anointed. Satan is the anointed cherub. Now, we're not going to get it. Jesus is the, is the, uh, the, the lion of the tribe of, of, of what? Well, Satan is called a roaring lion. We can go through an entire list of contrasts and comparisons between 
Satan and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ created all things in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, for the glory of his Father. Satan, as the anointed cherub, in his corrupted, polluted wisdom, consumed with self-love, convinced himself, I'll do a better job than Jesus Christ can do out there. So he took him. Satan violently took control of the heavenly places. And the only way Jesus can get them back is how. How is Jesus Christ going to triumph and spoil the adversary who is illegally occupying the heavenly realms that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? How, is, how did he do it? And Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts says nothing about that conquest. The, the majestic conquest of Jesus Christ over the adversary happened on the cross. Is the mystery a big deal to God? You see why Satan hates that message? And if he hates that message and he can't tamper and, and, and change, then guess where his hatred is going to be targeted against? Listen, he hates the message and he equally hates the guy who is preaching it. He hates the messenger. And we're not going to study all of that. My point is this. The mystery is extremely important to Almighty God. What is the mystery? Go to Ephesians chapter 3. When we say mystery, we're, we're not, again, it's, it's information that was never known. And by, by the way, God kept it secret because of that adversary. If the adversary would have known that he was going to lose all of the authority in the heavenly places, he would not have what? Crucified, you see, it doesn't say, and this is really important, if Satan would have known that he would have died for David's sins. Wait a minute. If the adversary would have known, he would have lost the heavenly places. He would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Ephesians, when we talk about the mystery, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the what? You notice, women, the dispensation of the grace of God. God reveals an entire dispensational purpose. Go to Colossians chapter 1 and notice how Paul writes here in Colossians chapter 1. When we talk about the mystery, it's not the cross. It's not even really about Jesus. The mystery has to do with the dispensing of an entirely new and different and unique program that God calls grace. The dispensation of the grace of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the what? Mystery. The dispensation of God, which is the dispensation of grace, is the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations. This entire dispensational purpose is the mystery. That's why we preach Jesus Christ according to the, the mystery. We preach Jesus in light of an entirely new role, an entirely new function, an entirely new purpose. We preach Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery, what God is doing in and through this new dispensation called the dispensation of grace. Anybody before Paul said anything about it? I dare you. I don't mean that in an unkind way. <laughs> Who before Paul said anything about the dispensation of grace? Do we learn about grace in the Old Testament? Oh, absolutely. Quite frankly, the reason Adam is given eternal life is because of God's grace. Noah found grace. But what happened to the rest of humanity? They drowned. You can't call that the dispensation of grace. Not until Paul do we learn anything about this system called God's dispensation. This is God's dispensation. Again, is it important to God? 
Oh, you this, yeah, you Bullinger rights, you know, you Stam, you O'Hareites, you know, the names, you know, uh, you know, sticks and stone, you know, call me names, call me, you know, dry cleaners, and, and you know, they, they have all these little names, you know, ultra dispensationalist, hyper dispensationalist. Ooh, you're scaring me, you know, you know, they, they, they create straw men arguments to try to intimidate. That's another tactic of the adversary. Call your names, right? Wait a minute. Is, is the dispensation of God. It's God's dispensation. It's not my dispensation, by the way. Oh, and by the way, I had a guy actually say to me, no one would ever know about this so-called dispensation of grace unless you teach them that. I thought, well, there is truth to that, is there? But his, he tried to use that. He was a critic. He was saying it doesn't exist in the Bible. So you have to fabricate an, 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 an entire theological system called dispensational Bible, uh, dispensational Bible study. And the only way it exists is if you teach the system. No. Now, Paul does, by the way, talk about teaching faithful men who will teach other faithful men who will teach other faithful men. A faithful man, a faithful man who will study God's word rightly divided. Not because he goes to church every Sunday. A faithful man has nothing to do with confessing your sins, getting right, keeping right, having only one wife, never drinking, never smoking, never going to the movies. Have, being a faithful man has nothing to do with praying, has nothing to do with giving money, and has nothing to do with spending $150,000 on a doctorate degree in theology. A faithful man, according to Paul, is the one who will rightly divide the word of truth. That's how you define faithfulness. Do you believe what God says? So, um, uh, what we have, God's dispensation is called the dispensation of grace. Paul says, that's what God kept to himself. And by the way, historically, it's been going on now for 2,000 years. God is dispensing something about his grace, mercy, and long-suffering. And, and we need to preach Jesus Christ according to that new dispensation that according to verse 25 it's the dispensation of who it's not mine you didn't create it I didn't create it God said I created it when did God create in his mind when did he ordain this dispensation that's why I'm go over well we already were there go over to um, Ephesians chapter 9 go to Ephesians chapter 9 Go to Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3. I hope you don't have chapter 9. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. This is why I wanted to compress time. We're, we're compressing the Bible. Because from Paul's perspective, he is always going to talk about what God was doing before Genesis 1. And then all of a sudden, Paul uses language now made known, now revealed. Now it's available. It's no longer hid. Isn't that interesting? As far as Paul is concerned, we're going to slide Genesis 1 and Acts chapter 9 together, and it works. God, before Genesis 1, already designed his dispensation. He didn't tell you, but it's, whose dispensation is it? It's his. It's his system. He kept it to himself. Ephesians chapter 3, look there at verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from thee, here we go, beginning of the what? Now, why does Paul take us there? We, we're, we're not going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember, uh, it was ordained before the what? World. Paul keeps telling us God is busy and God is active before Genesis 1, and it has a direct correlation and impact in his dispensation called grace and the impact that it has to humanity today. We don't go to Genesis all the way through Malachi or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to learn about this. God keeps telling us, I did this before Genesis 1, and now I'm telling you about it. Um, go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and notice in verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? 
before the world began. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, you can't, wait a minute, words have meaning, correct? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Over and over again, before the world, before Genesis 1, before the creation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before, when? The foundation of the world. Go to chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. Um, uh, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained. Well, when did God ordain this? He ordained all of this before the world began. We can't escape the clear fact that when Paul talks about this dispensation of God, which God said, I kept it secret, he takes us back before Genesis 1. In contrast, go to Matthew chapter 25. Go to Matthew chapter 25. In contrast to what the Lord Jesus taught. Go, oh, yeah. Now think about this for a second. Wait a minute. Jesus teaches some things through Paul that contradicts things that Jesus taught his little flock. Now, that's what drives theology crazy. Uh, by the way, Jesus did teach two different things, did he not? Did he not tell his people, you can drink any deadly thing you want? Did he not tell Paul to write Timothy, through Paul, Timothy, use a little wine for that. Paul, you're going to have to leave uh, Trophimus sick at Miletum. Uh, we can go on and on, right? Uh, did Jesus not say, sell all that you have? And yet he teaches Paul, hey, Paul, uh, uh, I want the church today uh, to give as they purpose uh, cheerfully. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can Jesus teach a system of truth uh, for the edification of the believer in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which contradicts what Jesus teaches through the Apostle Paul in Romans through Philemon? Because there are two different dispensations. You see why right division will save us from spiritual catastrophe. I'll tell you what, I am so happy. I don't have to sell everything that I have. I don't have a whole lot. But, but I, I, God does not mandate that you sell all that you have. Aren't you happy about that? Why are we happy about that? Because we're a bunch of selfish little... Yeah, I know what it is. <laughs> but if Jesus demanded and mandated that you sell all that you have in the dispensation of grace, would we have to do it? Because Jesus would have taught it. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? The Lord Jesus said, pluck your eye out, man. It's causing you to sin. Jesus said, cut your hand off, you know. Uh, how do you have eternal life? What did Jesus say? What does the law say about all of that? You know, I mean, come on. It's quite, so, so here is the conundrum. Why is it Jesus says things in, in the Gospels that are different than what Jesus teaches in, Matthew, uh, in, in, in Paul's epistles? Because there are two different house rules, two different different dispensations. You see, a faithful man will rightly divide the word of truth. And, and, and now look here in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, and notice there at verse 34. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Is there a difference between God ordaining something from before the foundation of the world? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. And the Lord Jesus saying, listen, here is a kingdom that has been prepared from the foundation of the world. It's just as different as that which was secret since the world began and that which was spoken since the world began. Those are two completely diametrically opposed systems. Right division is the key in understanding that God has every right to implement a different system. Did he at not one time say, Adam, you can eat all the trees of the garden? Was Adam allowed to have steak? God says, you can eat the trees. And then later on, you get to Noah. And, and, and long story short, did God allow Israel to eat anything they want? No, there was strict dietary restrictions. 
I'll come through. Paul says, you could eat whatever you want. Well, you do it with Thanksgiving. The, the solution is you divide. You cut. You, you, you see the dispensational purposes of God. And we don't study Jesus today in light of his circumcision ministry to Israel. We see him as the head of a new entity called the church, the body of Christ. See, right division. So, so here Jesus says, listen, there's a kingdom that's been prepared from the foundation of the world. When Paul says what, he, what God is doing today was something that God devised and developed before the foundation of the world. Well, so when was all of this revealed? Real quick, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're compressing all of this. Genesis 1, and we're bunning it right up to Acts chapter 9. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And notice there uh, at verse 14, of course, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When was this system of, of hidden truth first revealed according to that verse 16? In me first. God uses the apostle Paul as the means to get our attention. Now, isn't that interesting? How did God get Israel's attention back in Exodus? Wasn't it called the law of Moses? Did Moses originate the law? Did Moses author the law? Did Moses sit down and design and ordain the law system? Who's, who created that entire system called the law? It was God's law. God says, it's my commandments. They're my ordinances. They're, they're, they're my laws. And he entrusted it to who? Moses. So the way God got Israel's attention is he put the focus on Moses. God today is getting the attention of the church by pointing at this human figure who was historically the Saul of Tarsus, whom we now know as Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. It begins with and through the apostle Paul. You see why we, we, we just compress it. Paul is now, well, let's, real quick, let's look at this. Go over to Je uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and, and let's just uh, uh, appreciate this. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and notice, for example, verse 9, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, having made, Ephesians 1 verse 9, having made known, having made known, did you catch that? Remember all of these terms, hidden where? In God. Hidden from whom? Sons of men. Hidden from ages. Hidden from generations. According to Paul, verse 9, having made known unto us the what? Is the mystery now known? But wasn't it a secret? So at what point in time is the secret no longer a secret. At what point, when God said, I kept it hidden from everybody, did God now pull the covers back and fully expose his tactical strategy to defeat his adversary? You understand why Paul is the guy who says, in me first? Fascinating. Over and over again, we find out, wait a minute, go over to Ephesians chapter 3 again, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the what? The mystery. Again, the mystery takes us back to verse 2, the dispensation of the grace of God. So again, this is critically important. This is fundamental in rightly dividing the word of truth. Is it true God kept information secret? 
Is it true he now made it known? When? When in human history did God finally decide, I'm letting the world know about it. I'm letting Satan know about it. I'm letting the prince and the po uh, powers uh, in heavenly places. I'm now letting them know about it. When in history was it first revealed? Doesn't Paul keep saying me unto me? Drop down to verse 9. Um, uh, verse 8. Unto me. Verse 7. Whereof I was made a. Wow. Paul, who was injurious, he was a blasphemer, he was disqualified, he could never have been given eternal life according to the prophetic program. God, in his rich mercy, long suffering, and grace, in mercy, God chose not to destroy Paul. What right did God have to do that? God ushered in an entire new dispensation, revealing for the first time the, the, the manifold wisdom, verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of of the mystery. Wow. That is the system that Paul was given. Okay? So, when we talk about right division, it's critically important to recognize that's what we mean. Okay? When we talk about mystery, we're talking about this system. It's no longer secret, folks. Now, with that said, is there someone who desires to keep it a secret? Wouldn't it be the guy who is now an open embarrassment to the creation? Now, we're not going to get into what's going on. We will eventually. So here you have the angelic creatures that bought into the plan of rebellion. And now Satan is, ex is exposed as a complete failure. A devastating tactical error which results in his eternal doom. What about all of these other angels? that bought in. You know what they've now realized? We put all of our chips on the loser. Now, does Satan believe he's lost? No. But all I'm saying is this. If God says, I'm now making it known, guess who wants to continue to keep it a secret? The adversary. And how does he keep it secret? Oh, come on, the words of Jesus Oh, come on. We believe all the Bible, nothing but the Bible, and only the Bible. You see how the adversary works? He covers up the secret by placing layer upon layer of Bible information and doctrine. And so, You see, Satan's not a dummy, is he? Don't ever forget, he's not a dummy. He uses God's word against God. And he uses God's word against God's people. God says the remedy is right division. And I'm going to stop any wonder why the modern Bible translations do not have the specific, precise language rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? You think the adversary is operating behind the scenes a little bit? The last thing he wants God's people to do is rightly divide the word of truth. Because it exposes Satan for who he really is, an absolute failure. Father, we do thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you for the, the, the manifold wisdom. We thank you that, you that your Son is the Lord of glory. And may we learn uh, what it means to glorify the Lord of glory. May we uh, just relish the deep richness of your strategy that ultimately secured victory, vanquishing that adversary by means of the cross. How thankful we are for your son, who not only died for our sins, but also died for the purpose of winning back those places which belong to you. Oh, Father, we just thank you for our eternal destiny as we're going to be a part of that, uh, that purpose in, in reclaiming back those heavens. We thank you, Father, for the, uh, the expectation you give to us that one day you are going to subdue all things and you're going to do it by way of the church, the body of Christ, as we are given glorified bodies that enable us to do just that. Oh, Lord, may we never fear, may we never be intimidated by the satanic tactics to cause us to, to be silent, but may we, as Paul would say, with boldness, preach that message with love, with gentle hearts, and with clarity. And we ask, of course, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.